Well, I'll just start by briefly saying thank you to Paul for his kind words and for the huge contribution he made in the very kind of difficult period when we were trying to get the fund off the ground. Um, as Vivian said, I'm Madeleine Ansell. I'm responsible for our international collaboration in education, science and innovation at the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills. And um, I was around working particularly with David Willits, who was a very strong supporter of this fund in the early stages of its development. And I want to talk a little bit about where it came from and, and why we're doing it, because I think that will help with understanding the contributions that other speakers make later on about how your universities can get involved. So you'll all be aware that we've, been, we've just come out of a difficult economic period. And as part of the government's response to that was a realisation that we had to be much better at building strong relationships with the emerging powers. If we weren't able to do that, we wouldn't meet our trade targets and we would also lose partners for influencing in all kinds of public policy areas. So the Foreign Office led an emerging powers initiative where all departments were asked to think about what has the UK got to offer the emerging powers and how can we package it in such a way that they see it as an offer from us to build a new kind of, of very positive partnership with them. Biz went away and thought about this and decided that we are really strong in science, education and innovation and that an offer of partnerships in this area was likely to be well received. As I said, it came out of the Emerging Powers Initiative, and that was enormously helpful for us because it meant we had the Foreign Secretary's support right from the beginning. It also aligned with the international education strategy that David Willits had been leading, um, and this meant that, well, David Willits was from the beginning and a huge supporter of this idea and used a lot of energy and political capital in order to, to make it happen. Um, and we were also very helped by the fact that the Chancellor is a really strong supporter of science and innovation and recognised that this was an area where the UK really could um, present to the world that it is a nation with strengths and where other people would want to work with us. Um, and I mention all of this because you will all know that without quite a strong coalition of senior supporting government, it would in no way have been possible to have got £375 million out of the Treasury. So what's the purpose of the fund? Um, I mentioned earlier that there was a very strong coalition support for doing something in the area of science and innovation. When we got quite close to the end of the negotiations with the Treasury around the autumn statement, um, they came up with a proposal that we should make this fund part of the UK's official development assistance. And Sean will talk a little bit more about that. But that did mean when we were designing the fund, we had to make sure that we did it in a way that would promote the economic development and social welfare of partner countries. And this largely meant focusing, well, it meant three things. One, it limited the partner countries that we could work to, to those on the Development Assistant Committee of the OECD's list of countries that were proper recipients of official development assistance. So when you look at the list of partner countries that we work with, you might think one or two obvious ones are missing, and that will be the reason why. The second was in designing the fund, we had to think about how the programmes that we were going to deliver would promote the economic development and social welfare of partner countries. And broadly, we concluded we could do this in two ways. We could work with them on research that tackled the problems of poor people, and we could work with them to help them build their science and innovation capacity. And both of those things meet, um, fit within the ODA guidelines. But we also wanted to make sure that we use the fund to build strong, sustainable, systemic relationships with partner countries. Um, it was a feature, I think, of, at least at the government level, our international engagement, that we were very strong with European countries, we were very strong with America, Canada, Australia, kind of traditional UK science partners. And we really wanted to use this fund to build similarly strong relationships with the emerging powers. We wanted to make sure that the research we funded was excellent because it needed to support the continued excellence of the UK research base. And kind of as I said at the beginning, we hoped that through the Newton Fund, we would unlock opportunities for wider collaboration and trade. These are our partner countries. The way in which they were selected is um, Catherine Law and my team led a working group of people from most of the delivery partners um, that I will 
come on to it in a moment, to analyse which countries were, were, were improving in science. And we were looking at um, papers published, high, um, the impact of those papers, the investment that governments were making. And we were also speaking to our ambassadors and high commissioners around the world to get a view from them on whether science and innovation was a strand, um, a strand of, of the partnership they wanted with the UK. And we ended up with these countries. When we first bid to the Treasury, we were really focusing on a fund for our top tier countries, which were China, India, Brazil, South Africa and Turkey. Um, but the Chancellor liked the idea so much, he gave us enough money to work with 15 countries. Um, on the one hand, brilliant. On the other, as Paul hinted at, it did increase the delivery challenge somewhat. Um, the Newton programme is overseen by a board. We really did want to make sure that um, we were bringing in expertise from different parts of, of the UK science landscape. So you can see from that list there that we had government representation from BIS, the FCO and DFID, but also from the academies, from the research councils, from the British Council, from the Higher Education International Unit, um, uh, and so on. And this has actually worked very well for making sure that as we work out the strategic direction of, of the fund, we have a lot of um, very experienced and wise voices helping us to go in the right direction. We also, well, Paul alluded to the risk that some of our international science activity in the past might have looked a little bit disjointed. And so one of the things that we hoped also to get from the fund was to, to create a a kind of cohesive UK offer. Um, so we wanted a wide range of um, agencies and organisations that work in science in the UK to come together under the Newton banner. Um, but we also wanted to make sure that the research that we were funding and that the capacity building programmes that we were funding would be truly good. And we felt that we didn't have the expertise to run those kinds of competitions within biz. So we decided the best approach would be to um, to allocate some of the money to different delivery partners and ask them to negotiate programs with equivalent organisations in other countries and then to run robust, rigorous, um, competitive processes to make sure that the money was being allocated um, in the best possible way. A little bit more on the partnership. Um, we weren't starting from nowhere. The UK already had a lot of international research and innovation links with some countries. And here the idea of the fund is to try to take this to the next level. And I think we really have made good progress with that. Um, one of my sort of success stories so far is that um, we're not only working with the Ministry of Science and Technology in China, but with a whole range of other agencies that didn't previously work with us. And China is not only allocating to the Newton Fund the money it had originally set aside to work with the UK, but considerably more money than that, which means we're benefiting to the disadvantage of some of our European competitors, but we're also being able to access some money that China might otherwise have used for purely domestic research. Um, next month, we're going to India to sign off the Newton Baba Fund with the Indians. And we really have, I think, through this process, been able to... Um, to work with the Indians to take our research collaboration with them to the next level. With some other countries, we really didn't know them that well, and the Newton Fund has presented an opportunity for us to get to know them. Um, Paul led a delegation to Mexico in the summer this year, and one of the, the, the side benefits, I think, of that dele delegation was the UK partners who had gone out on it coming back and saying, we didn't realise that Mexican had such a range of excellent science and that their organisations were so aligned um, to the kind of principles for allocating research funding that we share. So it was a really useful exercise for us realising that there really were good opportunities for us to work with Mexico. A third thing is that we really want the partnership to be a genuine partnership. And this has slowed us down a little bit in trying to get the, um, the Newton Fund off the ground. But I think the, 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 I think the delays that it has taken to get money out the door in the first year will be worth it because by spending the time to talk to our partner countries, understand what they really want, we will have a much stronger programme for the next four years. And I'm hopeful 
um, that if we can demonstrate to the Treasury and others that this programme is a success, that there might well be a second phase of Newton in the future. And I've also already talked about um, how important it is to us that the fund is allocated through an open, transparent and competitive process. We really do want to fund excellent science and excellent capacity building um, projects through this fund. Again, as Vivian mentioned, um, we are organising the fund under three pillars, people, research and translation. People is largely about people mobility, capacity building. Research is about working together on the problems that, um, that affect poor people. And translation is making sure that we work together so that this research has an impact in the country. A whole range of different kind of um, programmes for, um, for, for people mobility being run by the British Council, RC UK, and the Learned Academies. Um, you'll see there's quite a few of them. The idea is we wanted to offer programmes right from... Um, young people still studying STEM subjects in school right up to senior researchers who are already building an international reputation. We've had some feedback that we ought to try and streamline this offer a little bit, and that's something we will think about doing in future years. Research, the problems that affect poor people, areas like food security, big data, energy, health, global uncertainties, living with environmental change, and quite a lot of others. It really hasn't been difficult actually to find um, areas of UK and partner country expertise that fit within this criteria. And translation, we're um, rolling out a new, well, the Met Office are rolling out something called the Climate Science for Service Partnership, where they're working with partner countries to look at how climate science can be used for, to, to the benefit of, of, um, of those countries. Research and innovation bridges, where we're working together around a particular challenge and global innovation capacity building. Progress so far, um, we've got good political engagement. We've signed memorandums of understandings with nearly all of our partner countries. And when we bear in mind that some of these countries had elections during this first year or were in a different stage of their funding cycle, this is really a very positive picture. The Treasury have asked us to, um, to get match funding for the Newton Fund from our partner countries. And this is not only because it's important to them to leverage money, although it is, but it's also that if our partner countries are willing to put money into the programme, it indicates that the kind of things we're doing really do have their buy-in and that they will put their effort and energy into it and not just kind of go, OK, if the UK wants to do that, that that's, that's fine. Um, we've got a good range of programmes with four of our five top tier countries. Things are a little bit slower with Turkey because of their elections. The little red dotted lines is, is the amount we were hoping to spend this year, um, and, and the columns sort of indicate where we are up to that. In year two, the picture's even better. Um, we've been ad advised by DFI that it's sensible to over-allocate funding because with international programmes, things tend to slip. So that's why some of the columns are above the little red dotted line of, of how much money is available. Um, and early signs of impact. I've already talked a little bit about how we're getting on in China. In July, no, September, um, I was in South Africa, and I was really pleased to see that South Africa have included the Newton Fund in their own national development plan as something they see as being really helpful to them in building their science capacity. And um, the UK is now Chile's most significant international science and innovation partnership, and we're still in the process of gathering other impacts, but so far it's all looking pretty positive. Thank you.